Hello, everybody. A very good evening to all of you. I am sorry that this particular session with Dr. JP Atwal was supposed to be a live conversation, but because of some technical issues, we will have to take it uh, as a recording. And I can promise that if you have your questions for Jyoti, and if you put in the, uh, put in your questions in the comments, Jyoti will take time out to respond to you individually uh, as an answer to your queries. So uh, please do bear with us and uh, allow us this little liberty that we have taken just to make sure that the session goes on in spite of the fact that there is some kind of technical issue uh, in the live uh, recording. So uh, just to begin with, let me remind that the Tell Me Your Story is calling for submissions for the writing program season five in collaboration with Rupa Publishers and the registrations are open now. And the registrations will be open only till 15th of February by when we will, by the midnight of 15th of February, we will close the registrations. Coming back to Jyoti, we will, I will briefly introduce, in fact, uh, Jyoti is a very renowned professor at the Center of Historical Studies School of Social Sciences in Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and adjunct professor at the Department of History, Faculty of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, University of Limerick, Ireland. She specializes in uh, gender history of India in the colonial and post-colonial contexts. But right now we are here to talk about Jyoti's brilliant book, which is Real and Imagined Videos. Uh, Jyoti, if you don't mind, would you just show up the show the book to the audience so that they can take a look at it? Yes, so this book is Real and Imagined Widows, and this is about uh, the book about which we uh, the further conversation in this session will be based on. Jyoti, thank you very much for your time this evening and for coming online with us. Uh, so before we begin the discussion and the conversation, I would invite you to uh, give us a little bit of, you know, a little bit of context on the book so that we can take the conversation forward from there for the audience who doesn't know the history of your book. Yeah, so thank you so much, um, Coral. Uh, it, it has been wonderful to come back for this discussion on the book. And I have I've, 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 I've been, I've joined your earlier session with a brilliant session with Brian Hatcher and Shorbani. And I think uh, I gained a lot from that. And, uh, you know, so many things which, you know, Widowhood still is still a very important issue, and it is a very contemporary issue, and it feeds into so many different ideas, policies, and welfare, etc. So um, the book basically emerged as a uh, as a response to uh, the lack of women's studies, uh, the lack of widowhood studies in the historical domain. Uh, we do have uh, good works uh, in the sociology uh, domain. We do have, uh, you know, good works in the economics domain on widowhood, where their property and, you know, the legality and the property, the cases, and which can be studied in contemporary India. And one can make sense of how would widows were in, in disempowered through property rights, etc. And legal domain, of course, remains very important for women. But somehow in the historical domain uh, the question of sati which was which is so evidently a historical uh, uh, issue and a gender burning gender issue which continues to be a burning gender issue uh, from that to the issue of widowhood i think we we hadn't really transitioned to understanding the the connection between this past and the present so there was this need to write this fill in a vacuum that was created and uh, in doing so i had to constantly keep in touch with what was happening in the domain of uh, the widows today uh, and the book is actually an outcome of my own thesis uh, from jawaharlal nehru university uh, and the thesis itself was built on an earlier mfil uh, which was a survey of uh, religious pilgrim spots like Vrindavan and Banaras. And uh, I gathered some experience from that, which we will, of course, talk about in detail. But at the moment, I think the book had this, uh, when I was doing uh, the thesis or the book, later on the book, uh, 
I had this idea of the vacuum in mind that this would, you know, we need so much, uh, we need to understand so much. There's so much that needs to be filled in in the field of transitioning from the historical sati to historical real sati. Who is this real woman? Uh, how does she live? What does it mean to be tonsured? What does it mean to be disinherited? And then uh, the book has uh, five chapters. One is on sati, which builds on uh, all the material from uh, Houses of Commons parliamentary debates of the 1800s to 1829. There were six volumes that were produced. So I, I have looked at uh, four of them and uh, so much evidence has come out that I think it would need, we can write three more volumes on only Sati and from your own wonderful work that you're doing, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, I would expect this uh, whole historical, uh, uh, you know, the context to acquire new meanings in future. And that's why it's so important. Your, your forum has been very important because of it. Uh, so from that, I have borrowed the real cases which have come up uh, of burning sati and how the legalities were developed and how there is the, they were, the colonial state was slowly and cautiously moving towards an act. But it took 20 good years for them to do that. And I discuss in that particular chapter how that could have, you know, the, how, mu how much uh, resistance there was to that. Although this period is again not recorded so well, uh, except for the cases that have come up. So while uh, Gayatri Chakravarti's, uh, uh, you know, uh, Can the Subaltern Speak? is a very good uh, paradigm to understand uh, this. That where is this, uh, where is this Sati? Where is, can she speak? I think in some ways through the evidence she can uh, because she's absent there. The, so the data speaks and it's us feminist historians who have to basically become aware of this data. I think that's very important, this historical data. So I used uh, ext extensively to understand some cases, brought in some issues of caste there. Then I moved on to the issues of geographical, uh, the geography of widowhood, uh, which was an upcoming issue, which was an upcoming uh, uh, trajectory of uh, study in sociology and geography. And uh, in Jawaharlal Nehru University, we had a lot of discussion, you know, there is no lack of discussion amongst colleagues. So it was very wonderful to even interact with brilliant colleagues from a geography department who uh, helped me develop my thinking on how a geographical pattern can be uh, determined for uh, United Provinces, which was present day Uttar Pradesh. Uh, so I did the, the widowhood in the context of uh, the urban life, the rural life, and, you know, made some, uh, made some broad generalizations about this with mapping etc uh, and I realized it wasn't very helpful it was not very helpful because the issue of widowhood is very diverse in some ways and UP presents a very diverse model and it's so difficult to study that because the, the caste diversity because of the regional diversity so but what has come out uh, very clearly is that in order to understand the womanhood, the widowhood, you would not go, you, you would not need only the economic data. You would need a lot more than that uh, to understand. And so my book is in a way uh, some kind of a pioneering uh, work, but it's not accomplished. I don't, I have not accomplished anything through that chapter itself. That is what I feel. It's so much, so many questions that I posed out of that, which people have to answer which other scholars will may pick up from. And the other chapter, which I, I really uh, like, uh, uh, is the chapter on uh, law. I discuss cases. I discuss the cases of widowhood being, widows being disinherited, uh, of widows challenging the court, and how this property act worked in their favor or disfavor. So there is a you know, the both sides of the coin and the legality is uh, becomes very important. Then I go on to another chapter, which uh, cause, uh, is very close to my heart because I was reading this novel by Priyam Vada Devi. And I thought uh, I should not bring too many other novels in it. And I should just look at one novel as a historical text. 
and at what moments did this kind of fiction develop how did this imagination come in 1930s when this woman was writing and uh, to my surprise uh, i could i was able to map the public sphere the hindi public sphere as uh, we know it and uh, i built a bit on uh, other other works that have been there like the public space space has been already dis expanded by so many scholars like veer bharat talwar has done it earlier then there is uh, francesco orsini from soas who has done a lot of work on this uh, so we have had scholars engaging with this but generally in in the sense that gender becomes a very umbrella term not and widowhood itself being a being a category i thought uh, it's good to focus on some so then i moved on to a chapter which was highly unusual uh, which was cinematic widow widowhood and motherhood so um, it it becomes a very cultural study rather than remaining a database study alone uh, i'm glad i didn't leave out the data or compromise on that so i think the book is well very well balanced that way uh, but of course it always you know there's always a scope for developing more and more and you know uh i think the the book has thrown up some important questions for the coming time in the cinematic widowhood that chapter particularly is focused on mother india as to how mother india uh needs to be uh recalled every time uh a nation is being constituted and that mother india is always there to as a as a cultural capital uh and um, i looked at uh, mother india the movie the mehboob khan's movie in the sense that it is a movie which uh, begins uh, uh with a married woman a suhagin um and she's so shown in the fertile land she's shown as you know symbolizing fertility because but also hard work which represents the peasantry of the build, of the uh, young nation uh, of india but at the same time in the end she brings honor in her role discourse which is so central to gandhi and i could see the sediment sedimentation of these ideals in the persona of that picture of that movie so i just want how nations are constituted uh, you know i think cinema is one uh, big way of knowing that so uh, i i i hope the other people will follow more and i'm still waiting for more uh, work on this uh, uh, of course there's so much interesting work that is happening now in nation citizenship etc so somehow i i would like that you know the book becomes a kind of a uh, opening uh, dialogue for, for more work to come in for it yeah uh thank you jyoti that was a very brilliant uh, way of introducing the book chapter wise and uh, uh, a systematic planning that has gone into the book i get to understand uh a question that would sound a little personal but i still want to ask that uh, probably i mean this is for the audience who are not into book writing or the young scholars both it would appeal to that uh when we begin a study or when we are drawn into a study the uh, what we have in mind is a little more ideological and uh, we probably have certain things in mind uh, when we begin something and we think that this is what i want to draw home but then by the time we come to the uh, end of the study or at a very advanced ongoing stage of the study a lot changes so uh, would you tell me a little bit that from the time that you when you embarked this project and then uh, at a time when it was at an advanced stage and even now i believe that it is an ongoing stage because you haven't stopped your work on this particular sub uh, topic what uh -huh. is the difference between that stage and this sure um Yes, yes, Coral. Absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. Um, I think what has happened to these ideas. Moreover, it's just not a book. It has come out of my teaching of now twenty years in JNU. Um, so the teaching itself uh, has been a learning process for me, and as has as is the case for a lot of teachers. So the 
in that i have developed modules in my teaching and that has helped me develop the ideas on widowhood as well um there 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 is there is new work that has come out on war and widows which does not look at the widows only as an indigenous category it links up the widows to the larger question of the empire and i think that is the new area which is emerging uh, what you call cultural trauma studies which i became aware of about 5 6 years uh, which is uh, you know uh, before the book went into after the book went into the press but i wish i could include that cultural trauma over there and look at how uh, the english widows and the indian widows were they constituted the widows of the empire and uh, uh, i did write an article after that uh, talking about war widows so i feel strongly that war widows have not been studied from that particular point of view so they could pro probably one can expand in that direction i think new work is emerging but it needs a lot of data because there are so many cases of widows who have widows who were widowed when in first world war or second world war and they have been uh, somehow they were not recognized as uh, as as widows as as objects of reform or objects of sympathy um, as compared to the widows of 1971 war or later you know the kargil war because that was not nation's war the colonial war were britain's wars so there is also this thematic difference which comes up when we look at uh, the widows we look at how uh, you know widows are perceived in past and present so there is a continuous dialogue that we historians need to have with what's happening in the present not to say also the uh, pathetic situation of the widows in vrindavan which continues despite Uh, policies and there is the west bengal government reports which have come out on how many bengal widows migrate to that area and this is one reason why i did not want to pick and choose the religious pilgrimage points mm. because then i will have to look at bengal or dec or or maharashtra especially the background from which these widows come mm. uh, i wanted to look at their space they lived space rather than where they originated i think that would also become a different story so i started looking at their lived condition that is something uh, personally i thought that was uh, something which i brings precision to the study uh, yeah I, i i thought it was something which needs to be done as a team probably this issue of widowhood has to be done as a project and uh, i have i have seen uh, the first few works actually there there are very few works even now on widowhood uh, uh mar old martha alter chen was the first person 1990s she started with the study of five states and she took an example of 600 widows and uh, do, did an extensive study and she got the money for that from from abroad i think from the ford foundation and she uh, produced the data for the first time so we don't really have a good data either it is one big big goals data that which is not comparable with the data of up you know uh, so there are a lot of these issues uh, which we have and uh, somehow i think widowhood is also considered an individual matter uh, as to how uh, remarriage is an individual thing well uh, not not really because sometimes even forced marriage was an issue post marriage was also uh, uh, you know i i have i have uh, articles i've seen articles in 1920s and 30s journals where the women widows themselves or women themselves are saying that look uh, we don't go want to go back to a family why can't we do some why can't we contribute to the nation uh, by being outside the family and that's something which happened even in the gandhian period which gave them some opportunity to do so uh in, and we have examples uh, geraldine forbes has worked on some bits of that so but we still have lot more to go in that one right so you know uh, when it comes to your the name of your book something that draws attention is real and imagined widows 
what is imagined widows which part of their uh, existence do you call imagined and why thank you for for asking that i think uh, that that is the heart of the book yeah. that why that that forms uh, i think the main feminist questions that we ask are based on that how are women actually perceived and how are they imagined and by imagined i mean something which is either representational or or uh, something which is mythological and uh, you know i'll again refer to your own wonderful work uh which uh, i saw references in your uh, some of your uh, programs uh i i think that by real by imagined widow i mean it is not only the sati the real sati which the colonial state imagined which the colonial state uh produced through the data it is the real meaning of sati which was also changing at the same time it was the meaning it is the temple it it is the sati stones which were uh, which 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 were again uh, had these uh, this aesthetic value whether the women perished or not it is the idea of sati which lived on and is still living on in in the way that uh, we still expect we women after the husband is gone to you know fall into certain uh, you know chaste models uh, or you know uh, i of course there's a lot of difference uh, between kind of fade into some kind of non existence if not by life but at least by look by ta- yeah. by choices by taste yes. that some kind of non existence no jewelry white yes. uh, no yes. colors just and we have we have evidence for that because there are women who were denied uh hair, were disallowed uh, hair they were they were supposed to tonsure and then uh, there is a there is enough evidence of them living a very self abnegation life of self abnegation mm-hmm. and i think i think that 19th century is evidence to that ishwar chandra vidya sagar has a very personal experience but personal becomes legal after mm-hmm. some time so had that personal not been there then it could not so the real and the imagined widow i think they go in hand in hand as to how uh, the they are constantly the mythology through mythology through textual reconfirmation the ideas of chastity are being generated and rejuvenated in the society over 200 years uh, of of this and i think that needs another book by somebody <laughs> just raise this and by uh by 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 uh imagined widows when i say cinema and uh, literature i mean the capacity of women of of 1920s 1930s li- literary women to imagine their widowhood as to how they are imagining it and uh, that chapter of course has you know takes you through the journey of the w- women of uh, a widow who becomes a this woman who becomes a widow but uh, refuses to take the share in the property of the husband and everybody thinks she is foolish in doing so she says he's gone i also i can't take it because this but he does but she does um, one thing she realizes later on that she, maybe she should have taken the prop the share of property uh, because after that nobody nobody treated her right in the house and she mm-hmm. was actually forced to leave the house and then i see this being resonated in you know some of the cinema like prem rog mm. show 1980s you know prem rog is a very 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 nice movie in that sense very nicely made very emotional i mean i mean you know the apart from the wonderful music and i think it it is based on the reformist model where rishi kapoor is a reformist you know he represents uh, a, 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 the reformist uh, rhetoric of that side while uh, the zamindar uh, the zamindar his name the uh, zamindar and the village heads they represent the other side of the coin they represent that so this ability to continue with these themes and, re- and either in favor of reform or in disfavor of reform to argue uh, that was not only textual 
that something was being imagined and accepted culturally by the society. And till today, we have this whole notion of the Sati Savitri, we, you know, you're, you're yourself engaged in that exercise of seeing the continuities. You know, that brings me to my next question, which is, uh, I having come from Bengal, I have my own stories and experiences and uh, history of hailing from a community which has seen the worst of what you are talking about. Uh, you know, um, this godification of women by saying that when you give up yourself, uh, give up your living, give up your uh, existence post the death of your husband is godly. This kind of this making the woman the Devi uh, and the politics behind it. Would you like to share your stories? Because I know that there you would have many. Yeah, there are so many. 1920s and 30s, uh, you know, if I go back to the evidence that I saw, yes, uh, there are so many uh, imageries, mm -hmm. anonymous writers in the, in, uh, uh, in this particular, uh, who write about widowhood, they're probably themselves widows, or they're probably not themselves widows, but they're probably uh, writing a, on behalf of widows. And we also don't need their men. So, um, yes, but at the same time, they are uh, looking at how uh, there is a continuation of the old idea of chastity. That is something which they resist. And I think that resistance is captured very well. But uh, in, in my field work, when I went to the, uh, the, the, the places, the pilgrim spots, Vrindavan and other places, I think there's a, there's a real cultural trauma attached to widowhood that is very clear. And uh, the scope for resistance is absolutely uh, not there. And these videos also don't want to talk about the younger their younger self, you know. Uh, although I did not find young ones, but uh, they must have been, some of them were young when they were left behind by the family and duped by the family by saying they'll come and pick them up uh, after two months and they never, nobody come, came back to pick them up. So they had probably worked in as housemates, they probably worked as uh, cleaners, you know, maids, anything. probably, uh, you know, sometimes as cooks. Uh, if they were acceptable. Uh, Did they you find not... them going for sex trades as well? Because that is a, there is a theory on that as well that they are often called. Sorry? For. Have you witnessed or have do you have any data that they are they have been called for sex trades or they have been lured for it? Yeah, well, that's why I was coming to that, Coral. Uh, yes, uh, nobody would speak about it really. Uh, there was such silence. There is such silence about there is the, actually fear. I mean, yes, and there are in that small city of Mathura in uh, district of Mathura in Brindavan, there are about 5,000 clinics, uh, which are abortion clinics. So, uh, one can imagine from that there are all kinds of things which, uh, I mean, which need to be documented, but unfortunately, you, you know, you can't we can't be, uh, you know, probing beyond a certain point you know you can't go in uh, and also not disclosing the identity I don't think there is a they have that politics of you know it's just that uh, I found that it was it was good to cap talk to them in the sense of capturing the pain and suffering and trauma but if the sexual part was totally absent because they were they were so ashamed of themselves and I think that is uh, where you know data collection is very difficult in fact, many of my students who uh, have uh, expressed their ambition to work on this, this is one problem I tell them you will have, you know, that nobody will tell you. So your data will be very, very uh, fuzzy. Incomplete in some way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but one can, of course, still gather from the age and, you know, where they, what they did and kind of have an idea that she must have been exploited. And uh, so, you know, or she must have been married and then left behind by somebody and you know, gone through various. So this is again another discourse that is waiting to be written. Uh, yeah, because 
I can understand why nobody will speak about it simply because the society won't allow them to exist if they say that they have, um, I mean, one is being exploited, the other is the widow, if she is young, she might have her own physical needs. As long as she is exploited, I think the society will try not to look at it. But the moment she seeks pleasure out of it, the society will have a problem that yes. she is a widow and she is supposed to give up. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. That's a brilliant point. Yes, uh, that uh, sexuality is uh, denied and uh, not accepted while it is imposed. You know, in some mm -hmm. ways. Yes. Uh, well, both very true. Um, from the 1920s and 30s, the evidence that comes is, uh, you know, the criminal aspect of uh, either the households, the widows of inflicting crimes on widows, they, we do have some evidence from that. Like uh, the more, the, uh, the evidence uh, in support of remarriage was primarily that she might be raped mm -hmm. by, uh, you know, a Hindu widow might be raped by a Muslim man. Mm. So why not get this widow should be remarried, you know, otherwise she will go and uh, live with somebody and she'll become, you know, the keep of that man. Mm. So the, she's out of that respectable circuit and you need to bring her back. And so many of them were pushing the women into this household thing. What, whereas what you just pointed out, you know, whereas if they fell in love with somebody, they, that was not allowed, that loving somebody was not allowed because that was not according to their caste class. In 1920s onwards, we see advertisements for uh, brides, uh, widowed brides, uh, for widowed men. And the match making was so strange that it nobody could really marry without outside the caste. Mm. For example, Agarwal widow, uh, wanted for an Agarwal Brahmin, Brahmin widow wanted from a Brahmin, for a Brahmin man, or um, uh, Banya widow wanted for a Banya man, a widower man. So reform was very limited at this point of time. That is why the boundaries of this, uh, of uh, what you say, uh, crossing the Lakshman Rekha was still not there. So it was basically a mechanism to re-control, gain control over these women. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure some of them may have eloped and felt disrespected in the family system. And uh, there is a lot of evidence for all this. And even uh, some of the 19th century, late 19th century writings, which are not fiction, but autobiographies or memoirs uh, of uh, women uh, themselves talk about the uh, non-existential uh, you know being of widowhood in their own house so there is lot of evidence right from 19th century builds up to that uh, and of course the present day uh, pilgrim spots are only reconfirming what what would have happened now there is there are a lot of policies like you know the government the whispering ball government does uh, make a study invests in the reports and studies uh, of Bengali widows who have come born there. But again, that is not under the feminist and discourses that we do. We don't cover them under the feminist discourses. That becomes a problem. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's such a fragmented study. that There is, needs to be a consolidation. Many ends. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, even when you, uh, your study is uh, focused on Vrindavan or it is uh, it is a pan-India study? I mean, uh, sorry, uh, I, you have said this of, once. If all of know. UP, I just studied UP, United Provinces. So I studied widows who are within the house mm -hmm. and who are, you know, uh, outside. Ah, right. Yeah, and of course, there's a class difference also, which is very evident that. Yeah, uh, because I remember my mother telling me about her bua, uh, pishi, as we say in Bengali, that uh, they were not, of course, supposed to attend marriages and stuff. And even if there is a festival at home, they're not supposed to eat. They're not supposed to eat when others are feasting. So, and uh, my grandfather, 
was not very open to this kind of a thing happening to his sisters but the sisters themselves didn't want to you know violate it because it's, it was a rule and uh, so my grandfather made it a point that after the festival was over the very next day something special would be done for the sisters but uh, this was only just one home our home my grandfather but but uh, of course the entire state didn't follow or the, i think what widows went through showed up in many films one of them being pather pachali which was a i mean which was which was just uh, you just get shaken with the the character looking back at the woman eating her lunch and there's nobody to call her back yeah yeah so uh, yeah. would you like to draw light on the kind of i mean whatever happened with the widows and the entire sati uh, system that had persisted over the years over the entire span of your study how do you see that affecting the politics of the country in and in what ways would you like to uh, spend some time on this uh, how do i see uh, affect it affecting the politics of the country politics of the country yeah uh yeah, this politics is uh the uh exact question that i have tried to connect with sati because sati you know obviously it was uh, not a, you know you could not interfere in the in the practice mm -hmm. and so it took a long time for the british at the same time the value that sati would be that a woman has to be like a sati that continued and that was reconfirmed in so many different ways for example when we have the age of consent debate in 1890s with the pulmoni dasi being one of the victims uh, of a uh, marital rape uh, if you can call her the first recorded marital rape uh, she with her the claim of the husband the eternal claim of the husband over the wife that kind of sacredness was exposed you know it was no longer sacred that you know uh, if if the wife was to be murdered this is a very uh, unequal not only just unequal it is a it is a, a crime oppressive it is an oppressive relationship and one can die as a victim in this uh, relationship it is no longer sacred no longer like godly and goddessly you know uh, it is not a, about marriage of god and goddesses mm. it's very different because the there's a girl 11 who has died and her body was not ready which was again a wrong conclusion that to her to be married uh, there was a wrong you know whatever logic was used to understand reproduction that was wrong uh, medical uh, evidence was there to show so that crack into in this whole sati the idea of the sati that she has to be she has to totally belong to the husband i think that was questioned in the age of consent act and shastras were of course used right from the very beginning samhitas were used even by uh, vidya sagar who was brilliant i think he was a, he he was he used it in a very clever way talked about kali yuga talked about how parashar's uh, definition was not sane how the kali yuga in kali yuga it is allowed where it is in the sati yuga only that she was not supposed to remarry and uh, you were this is a push against brahmacharya and so on so he was able to swim through that entire material and argue for that uh shastra is being very very uh, deciding in all these uh, i think in 1890s it, you know one when when one sees age of consent there is really no shastric evidence either to say a woman has a control of over woman's body or you can enslave then you have to use a lot from manu uh, you know if you are believing that so manu was also quoted but at the same time uh, i think the effort was to move it into a zone of criminality rather than keep it going keep it around going around in circles and that is the achievement which malabari and harbilash sharda two people who moved this whole 
debate from religious in the religious direction to a secular direction. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in the societal domain, in the political domain that you are uh, that 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 we are talking about, um, in that the mother India is being created, and that mother India has values. Uh, there's Abhinandranath Tagore's paintings, yeah. uh, which has uh, the very sadhu like, you know, Mother India. Then there is this uh, other uh, geographical Mother India, which comes up, you know, with the, in the she stands tall with a crown in her mm -hmm. head, you know. So she's almost being crowned, this Mother India, which is very different from Abhinandranath Tagore's uh, Mother India. So the mother India is constantly being produced against these political overtones and also the law is being constituted for women. So there is something very interesting happening towards the turn of the 19th century, which dis did, which creates this mother India. That is something which I say in this book that it is that argument for Sati, which is a ref which, which needs sympathy, reform, which is to save her which is to, you know, which is the white man's burden, uh, you know, uh, but also uh, it is uh, shameful for the empire that this is happening to, to actually producing this kind of woman, this kind of mother um, that an independent India can imagine, reimagine, reimagine its development, reimagine its uh, anti-colonial struggle also, remember its martyrs also, uh, rem uh, and push the reform for women also so that mother india embodies so much that is that is what has happened uh, in in 1950s and uh, i think cinema has done a great job um i don't fully really subscribe i mean personally i think there's uh, one can still question this mother india which is full of values of honor etc but the fact that she was taken out for, from the victimhood I think that becomes uh, important for a historian to understand, you know. So yeah, there's of ideas really after that. There's oh. a long way to go there, I think. Oh. There's a very long way to go because, yeah. I mean, just this morning I was talking to Namita Gokhreji and we were just discussing this, you know, that, uh, see, uh, I mean, the context was a little different. It was about menstruating women not being allowed in uh, during any puja and uh, or they're not being allowed to take part in any kind of religious activities so namita ji was telling me that you know there is a there are temples dedicated to menstruating women and i just it just came to my mind and i said that okay namita tell me this what if now women are capable of there's a huge creative I mean, uh, potential in women, right? They are capable of producing babies, which is uh, which is an immense power, mystic power, but it's available to women. And you know, so what if it's a hypothesis? It's not, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not documenting it, but what if the fact that a menstruating woman woman is actually in that space of or in that rhythm of her month where she is developing that creative potential which allows her to give birth so that makes her equivalent to god and that is the reason maybe why she is told that uh, uh, if you are a menstruating woman you don't need to worship because you are god so you know if you put that in the discourse a lot becomes different that is when your choice remains in spite of that if you want to worship it's your choice but yeah. then you don't need to because you yourself are god even a shiv worships a kali a narayan worships a lakshmi and that is how maybe yes. even the women can worship the, the one that they feel is their god so the entire discourse changes in case you put certain strings and tie it in perspective but a lot has already probably happened in that space where you will have to pull the strings really hard to bring it back to where the concoction started from. So yeah. my last question to you, Jyoti, that uh, a lot of work have happened before you. And uh, as you were saying that you have your 
students and other scholars who are working on the same space. Uh, I mean, where would you place your book in terms of the work that happened before and in terms of the work that will happen in future? What would you specifically say that this is the contribution of the book in between from where it has come and from where it can be taken? Yeah, thank you for it. Um, yes, I uh, I think I my work is also built on uh, you know certain brilliant uh, existing works that I read uh, as a student and uh, which which inspired me. And uh, there is always the question of challenging the power and understanding and then challenging it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, basically, the feminist body of work that we have till now is that work which has challenged that, which, is, which has taught us what is how to identify power. Mm -hmm. uh, so once the tool is given to us as to how to look at power, uh, I think the victim and the power, the victim and the perpetrator, you would immediately recognize them in, in history. And that where the power is shifting and where it has shifted in this and the, where the challenge is coming from. I think those are brilliant uh, trajectories which have already been laid down for us since the 1990s in India. Of course, abroad, you know, you have such wonderful work of, uh, you know, uh, I would say even Judith, uh, Judith Butler is, you know, a very, you know, she's so popular there. And uh, of course, feminist uh, Marxist uh, historiography has contributed greatly. Then there is the issue of nation, which is uh, Neera Yuval Davis and others, you know, brilliant works which they have. So I have, after my reading of these, I've developed some uh, ideas of my own. Uh, but, you know, still very close to uh, what I do is uh, the work of uh, Mira Koshami Thresholds, uh, Women Crossing Thresholds, then Prem Chaudhary, who has also uh, reviewed my book, so grateful to her for that. Um, uh, Prem Chaudhary's work, then there is uh, the work of uh, Lata Mani, which was very important, which is, uh, uh, although she, before Lata Mani, uh, Sati had been documented by uh, extensively documented uh, by some of the Indian authors, Indian uh, intelligentsia. But uh, it wasn't asking the question of power. She's the first one who inserted this question of power into it. And she's the one who showed the problem of voluntary and involuntary. So with this existing work, and of course, public space, uh, space was also open with the coming of uh, very interesting works uh, in, the, in the domain. Uh, you know, as I mentioned Francesca Orsini earlier, there is also some of the Hindi works which have come up. So I, because that was one language which I could easily read other than English, um, I thought it was important to uh, look at some of this indigenous material that was produced during that period and which note which usually historians you know that non-historians do not look at that so i just thought it was interesting and how the ancient texts were appropriated that was also very important same ancient texts how were they understood by rs samajis how were they understood by sanatan dharmis and what does it mean to be a sanatan dharmi and how is it different in, if, if Vedori manages agenda for both, but how is it different from each other's? You know, yeah. Still, they are not the same. So these are some of the questions which uh, opened up my, which added to my uh, work, which which uh, which I built on. And then after my work, I think uh, although I have gone ahead with other things, I have looked at as I said war widows, and you know I I would like to work more on war war widows. Uh, and the law, particularly, look at some of the cases of inheritance and how the back, women battled it out with state. Uh, that is something I would like to look into in the future. And of course, uh, documenting the religious spots, uh, religious pilgrim spots, have been my ambition. But as I told you, there are lots of problems with uh, you know. But also, I as uh, you know, I mentioned that. I think we need to have projects, not an individual author's work. 
it's not an individual's task. Yeah. It would work remarkably well if the project was given to feminist scholars, one from sociology, one so you know from uh, anthropology, one from uh, social uh, you know policy making, the other from was an econ economist and historian. So I think it's a it's a it's a it will be a great theme for a project collective work rather than uh, you know something which is done in isolation. True. So that's True. my wish. Would you tell me a little bit because what you said is very interesting and I'm sure it will be very interesting for many others who are listening, who will be listening to this since it's a recording. Okay. Uh, um, would, you like, uh, would you like to tell me once again this particular vision because uh, though this is a recording, those who will be listening to this would be interested uh -huh. in that vision that you say that let it be a collective work. What kind of yeah. a project would you like to devise? And I would like, I would love it if, uh, by after hearing this, if interested heads reach out to you and uh, your project yeah. comes yeah. into being. Uh, Coral, absolutely, I would love it, and uh, I think it's so useful. Uh, I myself have gained so much from uh, listening to uh, uh, scholars who work on literature. Who work on sociology. I'm a historian, I'm trained in with archives, and you know I work mostly with data and archives, evidence from the archives, and also memoirs and personal records. Those have also emerged as history now. Uh, but at the same time, I think it will be great if people can reach out, and uh, I will be happy to uh, receive emails if uh, you know if if uh, there is some interest in a future project. One can apply to maybe women's uh, women and development ministry. Uh, one can probably uh, apply to ICSSR. There are so many different kinds of uh, you know uh, institutions which give out money for that. Uh, but it will be a fabulous thing to, if that comes on, including yourself, Coral. You love to have you on board as well. You know, if I hope that happens. I yes. would love to and i would look forward to it in case that happens Absolutely. sure so thank you for so much jyoti for talking to me this evening and uh, elaborating on the book and telling so much not only about the book but also about india as a country and women in india as the citizens a part of them who have gone through various ritualistic and cultural uh, sideline sidelines and hence a lot has been a lot of India the way today it is stands the way it is and if this particular kind of politics was different probably we as a race and we as a civilization of men women and other kinds of genders would have a very different uh, understanding of who we are something that I am working on, a question that is very important to me. Who am I and where do I come from? And that is a question that when I look back, that who am I and where do I come from? I find that there's a large portion which is very, very messed out in between. But when I go backwards in uh, somewhere, I mean, after from history, when you go back and more back, you enter that zone of mythology, which is, a, which is a different kind of history, which is, I call it infinite, which you cannot limit into a time because mythology exists even today. You find that relevance even today. So I find that there, women were very liberated. Women were very, uh, they had the kind of freedom and they had the kind of freedom of expression, which was amazing. And then there was a long period of time in which everything happened, a part of which you uh, elaborated so beautifully. And today, when I look back, I feel that my religion and my culture probably expects women to be uh, intimidated. They want women to talk less and uh, be more uh, obedient and sacrificing. But I know that that is a product, that is a communication which has been built by many years of politics. And thank you, Jyoti, for clarifying 
what kind of politics has given rise to that kind of political uh, communicational misconstruction. Uh, Thank you, Koran. I also wish uh, your uh, uh, initiative, your program, a uh, very good luck. It's doing very well. I mean, I'm a regular watcher of your uh, uh, tell me your story and my students too so thank you very much and wish you good luck thank you so much for thank you so me. much and before we went uh, we end let me remind that registrations are on for the writing program season five with rupa publications do register 15th feb is the last date thank you so much bye bye good night Bye.